Morning, everyone. Um, my name is Eric. Just uh, hang tight for a few minutes while we wait for people to jump on to uh, the session, and then we'll be kicking off the webinar, which is um, on the topic of customer centric culture and how to build it. Hey everyone, um, you're probably going to hear me say this a few times for those of you who jumped on at the beginning, um, so just bear with us, but uh, we're just going to wait about two minutes or so for everyone to jump into the session and then we'll be kicking off, so um, just hang tight, get yourself, uh, I guess, a, a hot cup of coffee if you're down in Melbourne, um, and uh, we'll be getting started quite shortly. Mark, I'm not sure if you can hear. I think it's it's okay. I've got a new space heater that is making a little bit of noise, but it's either that right. or it freezes to death in the middle of the webinar. So I went with this option. Yeah, I'm fine now. Hopefully, I've got some children by the sounds of it, having a small fight outside. So hopefully, <laughs> <laughs> that's fine. COVID normal, yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Hey guys, once again, just for anyone just jumping uh, into the session, we're just going to wait a minute, another minute or so for um, people to jump on and then we'll be getting started. Give it about 30 more seconds, maybe. All right, um, what do you think, Mark, get going? Yeah, why not? All right, um, there'll be a little bit of intros as well, so if people jump on, um, that's all good. So uh, welcome everyone, my name is Eric. Um, uh, title is Head of Partnerships at Academy XI, um, which could be, mean basically anything. Uh, what it actually means is I head up um, the corporate training side of, of our business. Um, for those of you who haven't heard of us before, Academy XI is a um, training organization specializing in design and digital. Um, so we've got the public facing side of the business where um, people pay to go through mostly career transformation programs um, to get their dream jobs and things like user experience design, service design, software engineering, data analytics, digital marketing, um, sort of emerging disciplines, but broadly in the space of digital and design. Uh, and then my side of the organization, yeah, we do sort of focus on the same areas uh, broadly, but um, helping teams inside organizations to uh, to upskill um, either just in foundational subjects or technical upskilling to redeploy into new roles or kinds of things like that. Um, and when my side of the business talks about what we teach and what we're sort of what we're all about, we break it down into four different areas, um, design, digital, data and customer centricity. So today's session is all around the fourth one, which is customer centricity. Although uh, it's kind of an interesting one in that it kind of has, you know, dabbles in, and has feet in all four areas. Um, so we'll get more into that in a little bit. Um, just before I do, I just wanted to pass over to, to Mark to introduce himself. Hey everyone, I'm Mark Cameron, I'm CEO of W3 Digital um, and we are a, uh, kind of a boutique management consultancy in the digital transformation space. So we do a lot of um, experience-centered strategy. Uh, we do a lot of change management, uh, and then we move into the you know the technology enablement. So we sort of we sit across kind of all those those four areas that we're sort of spoken that we're spoken about. Um, and yeah, looking forward to the conversation today. Cool, thanks. And so this is going to be kind of a free flowing session between my, me and Mark, kind of exchanging ideas, uh, what we're seeing in industry at the moment. Because um, there's a lot obviously happening uh, in the customer centricity space. Um, so yeah, we'll be jumping off of that, um, touching on our experiences, some of the key trends we're seeing, um, and providing some tools and some ways of looking at customer centricity. The overall goal is to try and give you um, tools, mindsets, uh, ways of working for bringing customer centricity and customer centric mindsets and culture 
into your organization moving forward. So uh, before we kick off, I'd um, just like to acknowledge uh, the traditional owners uh, of this land um, and pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. Um, okay, so maybe we'll get kicked off. Um, I'm going to start by <laughs> right back to basics and give my version uh, or excise version, I suppose, of what customer centricity actually means. Because uh, it is a massive buzzword, something that people uh, throw around constantly. If you work inside a corporate, it's probably up on walls somewhere. Um, you know, if you ask uh, an employee of most companies if they're customer centric as an organization, they'll go, "Oh yeah, definitely. Uh, we're, we're customer centricity is very important to us." And then if you go, "Okay, could you tell us what you what you do, like what your practices are?" Uh, what your organization does to, to be customer centric, suddenly there's less conversation going on, I find. Um, so we've actually built for quite a few organizations like customer centric transformation programs um, to solve that problem, which we'll get into. Um, to me, customer centricity just means in, at its just most baseline level, just putting people at the heart of the decision-making process as a business. And when I say people, I mean all the people. So. Uh, that includes customers, it includes your staff, often overlooked, um, and other stakeholders who may be part of the business. So thinking about all of those humans um, when you're making decisions around your business, which seems like the most obvious thing in the world to do, uh, but often in reality gets lost when you start to look at business constraints, um, profit margins, um, tech, which we'll get into as well with Mark and, and all the constraints that come with that. And, yeah, it's easy to get into build mode or into, you know, we need to do this for this reason. And suddenly the voice of the customer gets lost from that conversation. So everything about today is to make is trying to make sure that that does not happen. Because um, at the end of the day, if you satisfy the people in your world, your customers, your staff members, they're going to be happy. They're going to buy more from you. Your staff members are going to stay with you. Um, and it's going to affect your bottom line in a positive way. So it's, it's a win-win scenario, but it can be harder than it seems uh, to do. Uh, in a session a few weeks ago, we focused on sort of how you can be, how staff, like frontline staff, can be customer-centric in their everyday jobs. Um, so that video is on our, on our website if you're interested. Today, we're going to focus more on structural pieces. So um, is the organize, organization, your organization, set up from a structural perspective to be customer-centric and to enable customer-centric behaviors? Because Someone can be personally customer centric on a day to day basis on the phones, frontline, but if they're inside a broken system, there's only so far and so much they can do and it's going to be frustrating for them. And their tenure with you will likely be much lower as well because they'll move somewhere that is customer centric from a structural perspective. So that's kind of setting the scene um, a little bit uh, from from our perspective on what customer centricity actually is. Uh, Mark, did you have anything to add to that? Yeah, I think um, I like to sort of view customer centricity uh, from a sort of environmental sort of perspective or sort of you know, macroeconomic perspective. So um, a lot, you're sort of saying a lot of businesses, you know, have processes, you know, sort of worn in processes that aren't particularly customer centric. And those, those are usually sort of uh, arise when a business is in an environment that's quite stable. So, you know, so the, so the customer side of it is quite stable. The, you know, supply side is stable. You know, everything, really what they're trying to do is optimize the business to get as much margin and profit out of, out of the market they play in. But when a period of instability hits and there is, you know, disruption in the market, there are, you know, there's new players, there's new things, then all of a sudden the, the competitive advantage is all about who can claim the customer. Um, so setting the organization up to be able to understand the customer's needs as deeply as possible and understand how the what the customer's lives look like and where you where your brand and your offering starts to overlap with that customer that then creates an environment where you've, you've got the potential to be able to respond to big changes in, in the economy more more effectively than your competition so i think that's you know from my perspective i mean you could also say that about you know agile or a bunch of other ways of thinking about about the world but from my perspective it's really um, that's the that's the key. absolutely you know it's humans and so on. But the key piece, the key piece there is is it's about you know long term, but particularly from a board's perspective, long term, um, you know organizational risk and opportunity. Yeah, I think that's a really good call out, and which sort of 
obviously is now more than ever before, or certainly in the last sort of my memory is this due to COVID is a period of massive change and instability. Yeah. Um, one of the sort of major fallouts of that has been that organizations are moving to a more digital model that's happening at scale pretty much around the world. And so people are trying to become more digital as a business, but are they building out those new tech, like technical processes, new platforms that they're onboarding? Are they thinking about the customer first? So like we, when, when organizations come to us to do sort of upskilling programs, they're like, okay, we're gonna go through a period of digital transformation now. Um, you know, if they're early enough in that process, we'll actually say, you know, I would call it a customer centric transformation, use that as the tagline, get everyone behind that, and then use digital as the uh, facilitator and you know, the way that you serve your customers better. And now is that time where there's a great opportunity to go out there and grab new market share. Um, you know, things are disrupted. If you can be a leader as an organization and move quickly, now is the time to do it. But if you move slowly um, or think that you don't need to move at all, you might quickly find yourselves left behind. So I think that's a really good point about that. You know, when everything is stable, you've got your sort of, you know, your business structure in place, it's business as usual. Um, it is kind of easy to lose sight of the customer or you just already you have your legacy systems in place and that's all good. It gets really difficult to sort of see a way towards change. So, I mean, a nice thing about this period of time is that you kind of, the change is everywhere. There's no denying it or avoiding it. Um, so you might as well take the opportunity to so a lot of what we do is to help build skill sets in organizations that enable the whole company to move towards being more customer centric that enables that culture shift when everyone does things together. Um, I might sort of, yeah, that's a good segue to, to talk briefly about um, the three levels of customer centricity that Academy XI talks about when we do customer centric transformations for clients. So if you were in the last webinar, you would have heard us talk about these. Um, so the first one is uh, frontline practices, which I touched on. So your frontline staff dealing with customers on an everyday basis, are they behaving? Do they have the tools to be customer centric on a day-to-day -day basis, in the grind, day in, day out, just doing their thing? Um, personal customer centricity is what we call that um, at XI. And that can literally be something that a person just, you know, they're empathetic, they, are a good communicator, they understand their biases, all these things that they can do just themselves to be customer centric. So that's the first level that we talk about that you wanna shift if you wanna become customer centric as an organization and to have that cultural shift. Um, the second one is what we call uh, team level systems. So a bunch of those frontline team members will be on a team that is uh, engaging with customers as a whole. So in that team, are there, are there KPIs set up to be customer centric? Are there reward systems set up to be customer centric? Um, are they collaborative as a group or are they set up to be competitive with each other, particularly in sort of sales environments and things like that, where a lot of the time KPIs, reward systems, the, the culture at that team level is all set up to be just to pull as much revenue out of customers as you can or to mitigate your costs. So, you know, time on call, you know, I can only talk to a customer for five minutes. Um, so that's the team level systems. There's all sorts of things that happen when your organization at team level is not set up to be customer centric. So, I mean, you could have, okay, I can only be on a call for five minutes, but you leave that customer angry. They then phone back, they lodge a complaint, there's extra time. They don't buy from you, obviously, the, you know, the clearest one. So there's a whole bunch of things there that you can shift um, to become more customer centric and then that actually will have revenue positive uh, on flow. Today though, we're mostly gonna talk about the third one which is organizational services, processes and underlying technologies. So the service journeys that customers take with you, are they set up um, to enable a positive customer experience? Um, the backend processes that uh, underpin those customer journeys and those touch points along those journeys, and then the tech stack that supports it and the technological um, underpinnings. So this is getting into the world of CX and service design. 
Um, so that'll be sort of the focus of today. And Mark is going to be particularly helpful around um, talking about the digital piece of that as well. So um, yeah, maybe want to sort of flick over to, to Mark and just get your thoughts on that and how sort of, um, I mean, anything really, but how digital kind of can underpin those service processes, backend systems. Yeah, I mean, I'll, I mean, I also pick up on something you said earlier, which was, um, you know, sort of how how a business starts to think and act around customer, um, and and a lot of that is in the leadership as well. Um, you know, there's, I think, you know, probably in a lot of big, you know, a lot of enterprise, a lot of businesses, there's many many conversations that don't have the customer included, um, and I think that's you know that that's where the culture starts to get more and more, you know, get further and further away from what the customer's needs is. But again, going back to the kind of dynamic environment that we're in right now, um, and the reason why sort of digital transformation is talked about a lot. I mean, yes, part of it has been the fact that we've been in COVID and we've had to invest very heavily in, in technologies to get all our, you know, get staff working from home or whatever else it may be. But a lot of it is, you know, kind of a pent up, kind of a pent up energy around how are we moving, um, you know, revenues, current some current revenue streams or new, uh, newly identified opportunities into more scalable offerings, which is going to be underpinned by technology. Um, and then I think, you know, that, you know, that technology discussion, you know, really needs to be led by that and needs to be led by the, by the customer need, by the, by the, you know, the human need, by the, how this is actually going to, how this is going to be, interact with our business and our market, uh, as opposed to the technology, you know, point solution need, because that's a very quick way to go down and down into a, a world of, um, I suppose, creating, creating technology for technology's sake, rather than just, um, rather than building out something that's going to have a long-term, um, you know, impact on the organization. Uh, and it's yeah. also, yeah, yeah. So that's, yeah, that's one, one area to sort of pick up on. Yeah, totally. So, I mean, we see this a lot. So some people in the room today will be CX managers, could be designers, yeah. could be from any walk of life inside business, really. Um, there's a big conversation that's happening across pretty much all industries at the moment about getting design and CX a, like a place at the C-suite table. Yep. Um, because without it, yeah, like does the customer have a voice because it is so easy to lose. So that, I mean, if we're going to sort of talk about takeaways from today is getting, getting, you know, that, like, I mean, in some cases, being honest, it is going to be a fight to get that suite, at, that seat at the table um, to, you know, bring the customer lens into everything you do. So, I mean, that's one, one tip. And I mean, one thing that I talk about a lot when trying to get sort of customer centric behaviors, like doing user research, for example, um, getting all these design principles. Um, a seat at the table is talk about risk mitigation with the higher mm. ups um, and say, you know, if we don't know what our customers want and we go ahead and build a, a big piece of technology, for example, and it doesn't land and nobody wants to use it, how much is that gonna cost us as a business, both literally from the cost center perspective of outlay, because dev, like, devs are expensive and builds are, are expensive. Um, or do even SaaS models, you know, expensive when you get a lot of seats. Um, and then the other side of it is just, you know, you've, you've created something your customers didn't like. A lot of the time you only get one opportunity to, you know, like over, you know, sort of over deliver to a customer, especially a new one. And it's really easy to lose existing customers as well. So um, absolutely, yeah, talking about like, what is your experience with talking with exec level around that sort of thing? Um, I mean, absolutely. I mean, you're know, getting customer feedback as a regular part of a, a product development or you know technology initiative is a really good way of mitigating risk um but i'd also sort of expand on that even further to say that i mean it, you know interestingly the fin review over the last few months um has been highlighting the fact that the boards in australia are actually lacking depth when it comes to you know digital transformation data you know knowledge about data and knowledge around customer and customer behavior um you know particularly at that kind of human centered design lens so I think, you know, if you're looking, I mean, at one level, if you're talking about an individual product, you know, that's, there's a team there that want to make sure that that's, <laughs> that's right. But if you're looking at the whole organizational, you know, the whole organization and where it's heading, um, and which is where kind of the level of the board, again, that, that understanding or, and I think being able to think it, you think about people, you know, as an inner systems level way um, and be able to think about, you know, how, how parts of our market are going to be impacted by, you know, technology changes or changes in the economy or whatever else it may be, um, is really going to be, is going to starting to be where, you know, the new battleground. Yeah. So I'd say um, that kind of, you know, that system, 
that's service design thinking, you know, that's, it, it's, I mean, it, you know, at the moment definitely needs a seat at the table at, at the, um, in the leadership area, but it's going to, that, that language is going to start to need to become moved into the boardroom over the next, you know, the next couple of years as well. Yeah. And that's huge, been huge for us over the last six, 12 months is, so like the pro, the, I've mentioned customer centric transformation programs a few times. So what we're doing with organizations now is we're, where we're moving the dial on all three levels. So we've got, and we're, so we're like a training organization, but we're sort of combined training organization and project delivery into one. Cause I come from a consultancy background. And so what I would see in consultancy space from service design, CX agencies, et cetera, is you go in as an external consultant, you create your new customer journey maps, your service blueprints, um, your new ways of working. You bring in voice of customer programs if you're more on the CX side of things. Bring all that stuff in. Um, you implement it for your client, the business. And, and it's great. And you've probably done all the right things. But if the business doesn't understand what you're doing mm. for them. There's this kind of like, one, just lack of ability to roll it out and actually operationalize all the things that are being done, the new service journeys and things. And also just a little bit of like, who are these guys? Just that whole like, oh, big four Deloitte came in and just like, you know, like dropped a big recommendations report on my desk and then screwed <laughs> off kind of deal. Yeah. Um, so I'd see a lot of that. And then from the training side of things, the scariest thing for us as trainers is we go in, we teach service design, we teach design thinking, we teach customer centric, like building customer centric teams, courses, data, digital, all these things. Um, like digital literacy, data literacy, and we do our song and dance, we leave and then nothing changes. Um, mm. And so those to me are each a problem that can be solved by putting them together. So we go in and we do at all three levels, we do a, like a learn, do, learn, do sequence where we'll go in and we will train. Okay, so, you know, this is digital literacy, this is design, like design thinking, this is how to be customer centric. Here are the tools you can use at each of the three levels. And then, you know, like the mid level is, you know, let's redesign your KPIs, et cetera. Mm. So you're doing, you're, you're bringing these ideas in through training, but then you're also going, okay, now we're going to work with you to actually redesign how you do these things as a business going forward. And then we're going to help you implement them. So instead of just training or just saying, here's how you should do things, you give people the knowledge and the skills, and then you help them actually roll it out. Um, and at the third level, um, coming back to your point, Mark, is where, okay, so if you're going to change service processes to be more customer centric, that's a big piece of work. And if your board exec level doesn't understand what the Deloitte's of the world service designers, the fjords are doing, when you come in to make these changes, they're not going to one sign off a lot of the time on the work, they're going to be like, I don't really understand this. So what we will do is we will do usually quite concise and short um, C suite training sessions. Um, on design thinking, service design tend to be the big two. And it's saying you're not going to do these things, but you're going to be able to bring your donate, domain knowledge and have oversight on externals or your service design team, CX mm -hmm. team, when they actually do these things so that you feel one in the loop and you're not sort of against it. And two, yeah, these people, obviously, they know the business really well. Um, and if they can understand what's happening, the whole goal broadly is to get everyone across the organization working on their levels, but then having feedback rounds so that they can see what the other parts of the business are doing, the changes that are being made to be more, more customer centric. And that's what enables that culture shift where everyone's like, hey, we're all working together on this program now. And it's not just all these things happening in silo. Um, and yeah, someone's just written advocates um, and you yeah. get all these champions that would have been detractors otherwise. So yeah. Yeah, I mean, I'd, um, I'd even sort of pick up on the, the risk aspect that you were talking about earlier on. Um, yeah. And one of the things uh, that, you know, we've seen, you know, we've seen a lot is that, absolutely that, you know, where there's a lot of really, really good work done, but once it gets up to the board, it's sort of like, it's seen as optional um, or it's seen as potentially, you know, too risky to do, or this is, you know, kind of in the innovation bucket. So it's going to be under, you know, so it's going to be under invested yeah, totally, in or whatever yeah. else it may be. Um, so I think it's it's really uh, you know thinking about the metrics you're going to use and sometimes even by the most basic ones like you know net promoter score or something like that thinking about where you're going to measure customer satisfaction or customer interaction and then how that gets framed and presented to the board um, you know there's been some really good use cases where where businesses have not framed that up as a measurement of customer satisfaction but framed it up as a as a leading metric for organizational risk and financial risk. 
And as soon as it becomes a financial risk conversation, not about, you know, how happy are our customers, because most of the time, you know, unless it connects back to something really, really clear, the board doesn't care too much. Um, <laughs> yeah. um, but if it can connect back to, you know, this, if we did get this wrong, it's going to cost us a huge amount to fix, or, you know, there's, you know, we're going to churn customers or whatever else it may be. Then we've got really, you've got really, really, really key kind of risks being, you know, sort of starting to emerge. And of course the board has to pay attention because they've got a fiduciary responsibility to manage risk. Yeah, um, totally. and as soon as the board pays attention, then the rest of the organization will then start to, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so I did a C-suite training session last week with a large organization um, in the aged care space who, um, it was just, it was a design thinking intro session. And it was, you know, you know we, were, we were sort of going through, you know, what design thinking was, the four steps, which for anyone who's sort of not familiar with it is, um, the double diamond is, is the framework for that. So the four steps of it are, go out and do user research, find out what's really happening with your users, um, gather together a whole bunch of research, synthesize it into a, a few key insights, use that to, to then go out and ideate, come up with a whole bunch of ideas for how a new product or service could actually help to solve the customer's problems, not the problems you think they have, but the problems they actually are telling you that they have, or you're seeing that they have, and then ideating, coming up with some like low fidelity prototypes, which is just, very basic, like, here's how we can solve the problem, show it to people, um, get feedback, and then go into like minimum viable product and build that out and actually roll it out to market and constantly be iterating. And when we first introduced it, it was like dead silence in the room. We couldn't tell if it was landing well or not. And then we kind of put up the four um, sections of the double diamond, um, research, synthesize, ideate, and then prototype. And we got them to talk through, you know, what have you done here? What have you done there? Who has had examples of where we've done something? or very interestingly, not done one of these phases and the yeah, fallout yeah. from that. And then the room just exploded and it was just everyone talking about examples of where they'd done one piece or not done it, where it didn't all fit together and like where the problems were and the successes. And yeah, someone's just written connecting it to dollar risk. Like I use the word, I think I said, maybe said it earlier, risk mitigation all the time. What they didn't seem to catch on to or maybe just didn't know legitimately was that design in, in design thinking context, like business process design is really about, you know, yeah, mitigating your risk, using data to inform decision making. I think yeah. it has this sort of conception at board level, exec level, that it's kind of fluffy and doesn't really have its grounding in like, you know, like data, which it 100% does. And I think that was a real tipping point as soon as that kind of came across. And like immediately there was buy-in, like the organization is, yeah, they're seeing like, lots of multi-level buy-in for using design thinking as a process now which is awesome so yeah 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 absolutely and i think yeah it's been yeah i mean i think probably the number of businesses that have been investing heavily in, in design thinking training you know in in the australian landscape has started to increase you know sort of all the time um because it is, it is just that you know it is how do you chunk how do you chunk out really big pieces of the customer journey or, you know chunk them down into into manageable areas and investigate and understand deeply. Um, and, you know, how do you use that process to create and form, form a new language around the customer? Um, yeah. You know, you look at, you know, it's, you know, very large companies, you know, some companies like Telstra and so on have been doing you know, a huge, huge amount of that over the last couple of years. Um, and, you know, it's starting to, it's starting to shift the way the culture thinks and, and the way that they, the way that they're starting to look at, at the market, which is, um, yeah, for a, you know, very, very, big engineering based you know, organization. That's a, that's a big shift. It is. Yeah. We do a lot of um, design thinking training for uh, digital organizations or, or di digital teams even mm -hmm. who are sort of, you know, cause you sort of have this tendency to think, Oh, there's a UXer in there. They're going to be good to go, but it's not always sort of built into the way they work. And so we often find like these big cultural transformation programs are great, but where we often, you know, find successes, we'll go in and work with one team, we'll bring in new ways of working, you know, they'll get across it, they'll start to show success from that one team. And then it's a pull instead of a push mentality where other parts of the business are like, oh, what's going on over there? That's, that's pretty cool. Like, um, interesting pieces of work done. And because coming back to the service design piece, like organize, like developing a new service flow touches pretty much, you know, it can touch every siloed division with an organization, you need a lot of stakeholder buy-in to make yeah. that roll out. Like for those of you from familiar with the service design space, many a service designer has built an incredible service blueprint out, which is like, you know, future state service blueprint, 
you know, the customer journey that they want to see inside the organization. Um, they spend, you know, the company spends months and months of salary or external, you know, like spend to get this thing built. And then it just goes into a dusty shelf somewhere and never gets done because they try to go too big too quickly, potentially. Um, so there is definitely a, something to be said for starting small, find those quick wins inside the organization and build out from there once you've got, once you've been able to show successes inside the organization, I think is huge. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. That's a kind of, you know, the set key. It's a, you know, one of the fundamentals of change management really, isn't it? You could find those, find those elements that sort of prove, uh, prove out the, the thinking, get people on board, uh, get the momentum, and then, you know, it's quite often those things might actually be have the biggest impact on the organization, or they may be lost leaders, you know, in some some case, but their but their their you know desire is to get people on board. And then you can start hitting, you know, picking off the bigger pieces as you as you go forward. Yeah, there's a few things there like with customer centric, um, customer centricity, like the, the idea that it's not a program, it's not something that happens for a short period of time and then is over. <laughs> and like yeah, yeah. customer centric now, congratulations, handshakes all around. Um, <laughs> yeah. It doesn't really work that way, unfortunately. You know, it'd be a continuing um, effort because the market's shifting, your customers are changing um, and you've got different business lines that do, have different needs. So all these things where, you know, you need to constantly be um, making sure that you're revisiting what you're doing for the customer. So, um, there's lots of tools and systems you can use. I mean, design thinking is probably the, the most obvious one. Um, won't be the focus of today's session, but uh, one thing that I think I'd probably like to touch on, which kind of crosses over both of our worlds, is like voice of customer programs and mm -hmm. then um, customer experience management platforms. So like the Qualtrics and the Zendesks of the world. Um, so for anyone who is sort of in the CX um, space, that may be something that you're trying to onboard right now or will be soon, something like that. So uh, I guess just as a brief starting point, so a voice of customer program for anyone who's not familiar, um, it's basically just a way of collating everything that your customers are saying about you into one, into one place and then using that for decision-making. So, I mean, it's really, really central to the core of being customer centric. Um, and it's quite complicated because you've got so like this day and age, you've got so many channels. A lot of it is marketing driven. So you've got all your social channels. Are you, are you like social listening to find out what your customers are saying? Are you, are you sending out surveys, um, your complaints department, um, are your sales teams and your customer service teams, like are calls being recorded? Um, do you have digital software to pull out key phrases from those calls? Like all of that which there's a lot of it goes into these voice of customer programs and companies that have really mature voice of customer programs, like it becomes a big part of how they make decisions. Um, but if you don't have one, like often people are just doing it ad hoc or they'll be like listening to one channel only, which can really skew your data. Um, and then the way that a voice of customer program is usually operationalizes through a customer experience management platform. So yeah, Qualtrics I mentioned is a big one, tends to be quite survey heavy. Zendesk tends to be more like um, ticketing and so on. They all have like their different like um, upsides. Have you got experience of seeing those rolled out successfully or unsuccessfully? Yeah, yeah. I mean, everything from the kind of like, you know, call center things like Genesis to, to, to as you say, to Qualtrics and so on. Um, I mean, I think, um, and I mean, I'd sort of come back to what you were saying earlier, which is that 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 it's the design process often that helps identify the data needs. You know, it's going, goes, you know, actually mapping out that customer journey, asking what information do we have to, to support this hypothesis, you know, at this particular part of the journey and what's missing. Um, and then that's where, that's where identifying the right tool set um, can become really, really useful. I think there's been a lot of businesses who've just gone, well, we don't know much about the customer, so we'll put it in a, you know, one of the big tools. And then all of a sudden go, well, we don't actually know what we're asking for. Or what yeah. we're what specifically we're we're looking to find, um, so I think it's that kind of you know getting those two things working in, in tandem where you're you're asking you know as an organisation you're asking questions about how much do we know about the customer, and then then instead of using that to define business requirements, which then defines the technical requirements, um, but starting with the technology you could sort of go very wide very very quickly, um, and not necessarily get the value out of it um, as, as soon as you would like. 
Yeah, hundred percent. I'm actually dealing with an organization right now where they're they've got a bunch of siloed divisions that they do different things. You know, it's fine. Um, one of those divisions is currently working with uh, one of the large Microsoft Dynamics channel partners. So um, Dynamics is sort of like a does everything Microsoft CRM um, yep. uh, for anyone out there that's not familiar with it. So they've they've engaged them and said, okay, we want to build out, you know, we need to do this better. Our legacy systems are no longer fit for purpose. And so they've gone in and engaged the, the channel partner and the channel partner happens to be like sort of friends of XI. So we've been talking to them as well. And we're working with this client too. And so this, channel partner is, is talking to the client and saying like, yeah, we can sort of, we can roll, like we can build this dynamic suite. I think it's a claims management system. Like we can build out this claims management system the way we think that it will work for your business, but we don't know your business. So you are going to have mm. to, you client are going to have to make a whole bunch of decisions around how you want to service your customers. Um, Otherwise, we're going to have to make those decisions for you. And we don't want to make those decisions because that's how this goes wrong. Because then if you're not happy with the decisions we make, you're going to blame us, basically. Um, and that's going to come back on us. And we don't want that. So we would rather that you, as a business, decided what these service journeys, how this system was going to look, and then engage us. And then we can build it as per your requirements. But that takes basically service design know-how on the client side. And so when we're coming in now and saying like, hey, we're going to teach the organization at exec level service design, and we're going to bring in service designers to help build out their, their service journeys, they're like, yes, please do that. And then we'll come into that conversation. We can tell you how dynamics can be customized to support those new journeys. And that like they're, they're happy about that, where you might think they mm. wouldn't be, but for them, it's great. So I mean, those are... So yeah, just lead with the customer and then get the tech to come in afterwards. So that's kind of an example. I'm a really good example of that, of, you know, sort of you know, the voice of customer programs and, you know, customer centered sort of tools, which, you know, sort of like, you know, personalized marketing uh, and, um, and I suppose kind of like, you know, sort of things like CRM coming together. I mean, it, it, in the higher education space, university space, that's one area that's like really, really prone for lots and lots of data silos. Um, and, you know, because they're quite often they're quite large organizations, they can spend quite a lot of money on technology, you know, trying to understand the customer and move them through. But you've got different silos. You've got, you know, sort of like the student, you've got the marketing, then you've got this, you know, student um, acquisition or, you know, admissions. Um, and then you've got kind of got the onboarding and then into the different faculties. Quite often, you know, it's sometimes it's really, you know, mapping that journey out for a stu from the student's lens. You find out there's really simple things you can do, which is you've already asked the student, you know, or the potential customer that this bit of information once, you don't have to ask it again. Let's make sure that we're passing that information on to other, the other relevant parts of the business. Uh, sometimes it's that simple kind of insight, which can have the biggest impact on the customer journey. Um, and then realizing that, you know, that it's actually not difficult to implement. Yeah, something, the way we kind of solve that ourselves is we like, we literally will, I will teach customer journey mapping to almost anybody. I think yeah, almost yeah. everyone can benefit from it. It just gives them this like sort of more end-to-end yeah. -end view of their business. Even like frontline staff, we teach it to all the time. Because if they've got, if they've got a bunch of customers coming to them and there's some problem going on with the customer and they don't quite understand what it is, they're mad by the time they get to them. Having kind of an insight into what that customer might have done before they got to that frontline staff member, they can go, oh, I think I see what's happening here. And then they can start to try and solve it at sort of more exec level. You teach people customer journey mapping and then service blueprinting. Then suddenly they're like, okay, I can see the whole organization. Mm. And then like, you've got the tech map down there. And then you can say like, okay, is this data going here? And is this data, is this person seeing this data? And they're going like, hmm, I don't, I don't think that they are seeing that data. And then that can really kick off the conversation of like, okay, let's start to get these data points together so that we can get a, like a holistic view of the customer and, you know, where they're happy and not happy during customer journeys and things like that. Yeah. So for us, it's a huge, it's a huge piece. It's, you know, it's simple enough to teach. I mean, they get obviously very complex, but um, yeah. exec yeah. level loves them, loves service blueprints. As soon as we show them, they're yeah. like, why didn't we have this before? <laughs> yeah. This is crazy, like, because it's just not a tool that they usually get often get access to so well quite often uh, quite often i've seen uh, technology projects where they they don't do the service blueprinting until something starts going wrong 
Yeah. <laughs> uh, and then and then they go back and start doing the service blueprint again and realize they've just spent, you know, a year or so building a bit of technology with, you know, completely the wrong lens. Um, you know, so so it's much better off, you know, particularly when you're talking about that risk aspect of it, it's much better off doing that first of all before you start building a single thing. Um, because you know, you're just gonna you mitigate that risk and make sure you're you know you're spending money on what you should be spending money on. Yeah, I mean, that's really what I talk about with design thinking is it's a process that has a flow to it. There is a lot of iteration built into that, but at its base, it kind of says like, look, this is the process we're going to go through. It enables people at all levels of business to kind of be like, have we done our user research? Do we know our, our customer yet? And it, like, we're not really moving forward until we've done that bit. And you can kind of just hang your hat on that when you're trying to get buy-in from different parts of the business. Um, we've got about 20 minutes to go. So there's a few questions in the Q&A. Um, anyone who's, who's got a question, you can start firing them in there right now. Um, I might jump into these ones now because they've been sitting there for a little bit. Sorry for the delay. So from Craig, um, I'm just going to read this off on the fly. So hi, we supply a technical product in a new industry, home, home battery systems. Okay. Um, I think I know what that is. Um, and looking to be customer centric. How do you recommend not getting lost in our technical knowledge and the education level of everyday customers, which can be vast. And this is not sales related, but more of a service after sales point of view. Um, really good question. So very good question. Touch some of it. Mark, did you want to jump in there? Um, look, I think that's a really good question. I mean, it's, it's fundamentally, it's at the core of what kind of business do you want to create as you scale up? And as you say, you've probably got a lot of engineering based people, you know, sort of a lot of people who have got a lot of technical knowledge. Um, and they view they view the world. So, so engineering culture quite often views the world as what's the problem? How am I going to fix it? So it's sort of, you know, it's sort of like identify the problem, be specific about that, then we'll go away and fix it and we can do a brief. Um, but I think you know, when you're looking at when you're looking at um, you know, being customer centric, it's much less about individual problems initially. Yes, you have to identify those, but it's much more what's the outcome the customer is looking for. You know, what is the what is the what is the context that that customer lives in? Um, how do we understand that customer? And developing that kind of language um, can have a really, really, really big impact um, on the way that the organisation you know moves moves forward. Yeah, hundred percent agree with that. And so, from the world of design, um, there's a quote that's quite popular that is, um, "People don't want." I might do this. I might get this wrong, but people don't want a quarter inch drill. They want a quarter inch hole. They don't care mm -hmm. how you do the thing. They just want their problem solved. So there's actually a tool that designers use called a "How might we?" statement, which is, "How might we do a specific thing?" for a specific person so they can solve a specific problem. So it, it helps to open up, it seems really simplistic, but it helps open up that thinking of, okay, we, it's not all this technical, you know, all these technical specs and all this stuff, what needs to go into this, all these features in your backlog, if you're getting into the product management and, and like digital build space, it's just, what does the customer actually need? Like yeah. some, the actual thing they need from you is so simple and like, Another good quote from design is good design is invisible. Good product design is invisible. It's kind of a sad, a sad truth of service design and product design is that if it's really good, people go, they use it, it does the thing they need and then they never think about you again, but they yeah. still paid for it and they will still pay for it the next time they need it. Um, and they will tell people. And then if you can wrap an experience around that, that's when they start actually doing word of mouth and talking about you. So, yeah, it's almost like the, um, I mean, it's the, you know, the, that other technique where, you know, jobs to be done. So understanding what are the actual jobs the customer's trying to do um, yeah, and using that as a way. Yeah. I mean, there's that great, um, there's a great famous kind of quote around that, or famous kind of use case around jobs to be done, where uh, I think there was a chain of movie theaters in the US were looking at, you know, how do we, how do we sell more tickets, um, you know, movie tickets in the middle of the day? So they met in, you know, kind of screenings and they were doing everything that they thought they should do to try and be what they thought was customer centric, which was reduce prices, uh, give away free popcorn, you know, all those kinds of things, but they still weren't able to do it. But then actually going in and, and interviewing, observing, understanding the customer made them realize that first of all, they were it was completely the wrong kind of like angle they were taking. The main person who would want to be buying a ticket in the middle of the day ended up being mothers with young children. So what they did is they put it, ended up putting a crash inside the, uh, uh, you know, sort of a, a charge for crash or a free crash inside the movie theater, actually put the prices up to cover the cost of it. 
um, and ended up selling out. Not only that, they did it. They did that same kind of. So after that had been running for a while, they did that same kind of research ongoing and realized that quite quite often those uh, those young mothers would would want to have a sleep. So they ended up putting the lights down and turning the volume down a bit, and they had the whole theaters going to sleep for a couple of hours. <laughs> <laughs> so again, it's like, what's the outcome? That, what's the outcome the customer is looking for? Um, but yeah, really good question, Craig. And I mean, it is it is difficult, especially when you've got technical teams not to get lost in the technical details. So yeah. I mean, it is it's, it sounds like a simplistic answer just to say, focus on what the customer actually needs, because it's something often, it's something really simple. Um, and then communicate in that way. Everything should just be communicating um, how you're solving that problem for them, really. And that can be that can really help in the back end, too, of just a lot of design teams that are working with, with developers and product designers constantly reframing, how does this help? How does this help the customer? How does it help the customer, et cetera? Um, so really good question. Um, another one from Renee. Uh, so vo for voice of customer programs, what does best practice program look like for service organizations, professional service providers? So to not call centers. So, um, I mean, I do, from my perspective, I don't think that there is one sort of set answer for that. It'll be what channels are, are you interacting with your customers through? What data are you trying to collect? Um, it is something that realistically an expert probably needs to build out for you. It's something people do full time. But Mark, maybe you can jump in on that. Yeah, look, I, mean, I think um, uh, the one thing I'd say, and it's just, I mean, you know, it's, it's not really a, a, a problem. Sorry, this isn't really going to be an answer, but, but, um, but um, for this kind of stuff, like like you know, looking at digitization, digital transformation, customer centricity, you know, voice of customer, best practice sometimes is a bit of a red herring. Um, you know, a lot of oh, quite often best practice has been has you know is imported from other parts of the world, or you know, and or you know, they've looked at you know you know places like you know what what is a company that's similar to us in the US done, but you got completely different you know completely different market, different scale. So quite often you know there's elements of best practice you can learn from but quite often we quite often particularly in this part of the world we have to kind of create it ourselves um or work with uh, work with others to 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 really design what's going to be going to be best for our customer uh in our in our market um and but then start small you know and build on it and build on it and build on it more often than not it isn't going to be you know the actual program it's going to be the capability that you bring into the organization to to ask the right questions um and then um, and then start to start to identify the, the you know the chunks of data that are missing. Yeah, one thing I would say to add to that is um, so yeah, from a sort of one of the challenges of customer centricity is that because it's unique to your clientele, there often is no sort of best practice. There's no the sort of magic bullet that's going to fit your needs. It should be a deep understanding of your customers that leads to those best practices that exist inside your organization i would say with a service um like professional service providers one thing that we see that often isn't done is are you collecting data from the people that interact with your customers the most so like say you're a law firm for example like so a lawyer is going to have these long deep relationships with their clients are you actually collecting a, is there any way for you to collect data from those interactions, there often isn't. Um, a lot of the organizations that we uh, work with will be like, are you collecting data here? Are you collecting data there? And they'll be like, oh, we just send out an annual survey. And that's on, often a broken model because you're just not getting realistic data from that. Um, and, it, and I guess it comes into the difference between qual and quant data as mm -hmm. well. So everyone in the world, exec level down, is comfortable using quantitative data. Um, they'll hang their hat on that. They will, you know, sort of say, "Hey, the quant, the, you know, you show someone a, a <laughs> like a Google slides or sorry, a Google Doc or um, or an Excel Doc, and they'll be like, "Oh, great!" But then you start talking about qualitative data, and they're like, "Whoa, whoa, whoa! What's this all? What's this fluffy stuff all about?" But the qualitative data that you can gain from your frontline staff, because a lawyer is still a frontline staff member, you know, it's it's interesting to sort of shift your thinking that way. You think frontline staff, you think call center, you think like a grocery store, but like all these professional services people are customer facing all day long. If you can mm -hmm. find ways to start collecting data from them and their interactions with customers, that's when you can start building out custom, like VOC programs at almost in almost any business. 
Um, but it can be challenging. It's how do you collect data in the flow of their work without making it super annoying and then hating you, <laughs> basically. Uh, so there are there are various ways to do that. We probably won't be able to go in detail. Mark, anything to add to that? Um, no, well, I mean, it was sort of actually building on one of the other questions here, which is, you know, how do you get the stakeholders to hold their input a little less tightly? So that's similar to sort of building on, you know, that qual versus quant conversation as well. I mean, often, um, you know, often thinking about um, what types of research are, are necessary and what part of the process. Um, you know, qual is really, really good, you know, obviously of getting deep in, you know, insights and getting deep, um, you know, knowledge about the customer and developing empathy um, and, and sparking off ideas. Um, and but then quite often some, you know, people get kind of really emotionally connected to their own ideas. Um, starting early with the language of, of talking about cultural, but, you know, talking about our own inbuilt biases, you know, thinking about, um, you know, every early idea in the process is a hypothesis, not, not something that, you know, and then it needs to be tested. Um, and that's where quant can be really, really useful as well, as well. Um, you know, actually going in, well, here's a good hypothesis, let's test it. Um, so, yeah, I think that's um, thinking about, you know, thinking about how you're managing, you know, all those stakeholders as you, as you go through is really, really, you know, key part of key part of the successful design process. Yeah, that is a really good question. So the stakeholders question um, <laughs> from Esther, I think, is it can be really challenging because especially when you're moving inevitably up into senior level, there's this sort of view tends to be that, you know, hey, I've been in this business for 40 years, et cetera, et cetera. I know exactly who our customers are. Um, don't try and tell me. You know, don't try and you, you know, external individual, don't try and tell me or <laughs> person who's lower down. This is a bit of a negative slant on this. It's not always the case, but it can occur. And if you just, yeah, by bringing, I usually start with quant, bring some, like if you can go and find some key insights from quant and put them in front of them, something that, so we will always try and shock people with data to start something mm. that didn't know about their customers and go, hey, did you know this? And they go, whoa, what, really? And so we want that moment of them going like, oh crap, I did not know that. And then mm. maybe, you know, that kind of gets you the next moment in time to like bring in qual and be like, hey, did you know, like we had an hour long interview with these 10 people and this is what they were saying. Seven of the 10 of them said this and they go, oh wow, really? And then if you can, the research piece is the hardest thing to sell in. It also happens to be right at the beginning. But if you can yeah. get those really like those shock moments, you get that initial buy-in and then the research, and then it becomes really hard to argue with you because you're like, well, this is what the data is saying. Um, and that's when, that's part of that I talked about earlier, shifting the concept of a designer from like, here's all these cool, unachievable ideas that I've had to here's what our customer is saying. Here it is in a you know shareable document, like an empathy map or a persona um, or other, whatever documents, you know, those are design documents. Use whatever you think is going to land with your audience, really. Yeah, yeah. And then, and then just get them bought in on the concept of solving that customer's problems. And then you'll find that going through the full process is a lot easier to do. Yeah, I found, um, we, we've, we did a piece of work a while ago with, you know, with a customer who did a big piece of, uh, you know, sort of journey mapping. And we realized that the culture of that organization, there was a lot of kind of anecdotal information. So, you know, we, within that journey map, we put a lot of, you know, photos of, photos of their customers and quotes and so on. Um, but had that really big, on their wall and you know over a period of a few months we realized that that the execs and all of their managers were actually going out and asking their customers themselves those same kind of questions writing them on post-it notes and adding them to that to that journey map so you could sort of see that how that was starting to permeate and through the organization and the way that we're thinking and to me that's you know that's absolute win from uh, you know from from my, from my perspective yeah, I mean, that's what we're, when I'm talking about those three, those three levels, the frontline practices, team level systems, and the organizational services and process design, when you, that's why we try to do training and then delivery at all three levels at once to shift, like, you know, the frontline practices, change the KPIs, rewards at the team level, and then, and then do service process rollouts, because you get everybody suddenly, suddenly the CEO is like, yeah, wants to go out and and talk to customers and find yeah. out what's happening at that frontline level. They're going to go down to a frontline staff member and be like, I want to shadow you for a day, show me your world. And they, they're doing that because they've been introduced to sort of the concept of journey maps to service design. They, and they understand some of these tools that can be used to be more customer centric. And they, they suddenly get curious and they want to know. And 
suddenly like, you know, you're a frontline staff member, the CEO comes up and they're interested in your world. Like how enabling and empowering of a moment is that? And then mm-hmm. you're empowered. And then you're also like, these guys want to, they want to understand. And so making frontline the, I also often talk about making frontline the SME of the customer because they yeah. know they've got all the data that nobody else does. It's all up in their heads though, a lot of the time. And as soon as you kind of like let them think about themselves in that way, they're like, I have value to bring mm. that even just that shift is massive. And then if you get exact level kind of, okay, here's the process for shifting services to be more customer centric. Cause a lot of the time exec level they're in, okay. Just being honest, they're in their sixties. They don't come from this design, this digital world, but there's no safe space for them to put their hand up and go, I don't know this stuff. And so yeah. they just have to kind of fake it till they make it or pick it up on the side. Um, and it's really, it's a problem for them. Like imagine how stressful that would be for an exec level person to have this imposter syndrome around this new world and the new business that they're in. So that's where we'll come in and just do like one hour sessions of like, here's design thinking, here's service mm. design. Here's how to use data to make decision makings in a custom, with a customer lens. And they're like, thank you. <laughs> like, you know, like in this safe space. And it's like, thank you for telling us this stuff because we had nowhere we could go and we were just trying to pick it up on the fly. So all of those things done in tandem can lead to this grassroots culture shift where everyone's suddenly working together towards this common goal, which is super challenging, but super cool if you make it happen and is when you really see actual change happen culturally and to the bottom line and for customers. Yeah, totally, totally agree. Um, absolutely. And, and, and really thinking about the language you use around that as well. I mean, as you say, like sometimes using a language like innovation, for example, is a really good term because it almost gives some of those people permission to say, OK, it's new. Therefore, I don't have to know everything. Um, you know, it's, it's thinking about what the, you know, what's going to work in the culture of the organization that you're working in and, and how that may how you may shape that up. Um, so, you know, sometimes innovation is viewed as too scary. That's fine. But, but, you know, understanding, you know, who the stakeholder is, what language can we use and how do we create that safe space for people to, to be able to say, no, I don't know, let's go find out. Let's, you know, let's get, let's get viewpoints from everywhere. Um, and I don't have to be the expert. Then that's, that's fantastic. Yeah. It's called the, the beginner's mindset. So it's just, you know, yeah. leaving everything you think, you know, at the door, it's hard to get people into, but once you do super useful, I mean, design sprints, innovation sprints are really good for getting into that space. Um, so we're just, we've got about three minutes to go. Um, thanks, Esther, that's nice. Um, so I guess a few last thoughts from, from me anyway is, you know, co- customer-centric transformations, like to become culturally more, it is challenging. There's a lot of work to be done, but, you know, we've spent, XI spent the last couple of years building out these, you know, like very small tools, medium-sized tools, programs um, that you can sort of, used to roll out in the space where there's, I mean, usually it's where the biggest problem is, is where you go and solve Mm. that. Um, And then people go, oh, wow, that worked. Um, What else can we do? And then you get that incremental buy-in. So to me, that would be my biggest takeaway is find the biggest problem space and then use, you know, design thinking, use, you know, customer centric techniques to try and solve it. And then people will come to you. They'll be like, mm. how do you do that? It'll also make you look like a total gun, which is not a bad side <laughs> effect. Um, yeah. Any last thoughts from you, Mark? Uh, look, mate, no, no. I think that's, I think that's, you know, I think just really, I mean, just really uh, you know, being the champion of, you know, putting the human first um, and wherever there are conversations around the, the technology stuff. I mean, hey, look, you know, we're very much into technology driven transformation, but um if it's just technology for technology's sake, then it's never going to work, um, or or it's just it's going to be viewed from the wrong direction. Um, so it's far more exciting always when when businesses stop thinking about just just cost out or whatever else it may be, but actually start thinking about how do we enable our customers, how do we enable our people to do more interesting things. That's where the, that's where the conversation becomes really exciting, and the technology uh, out, outcomes can become even you know even more exciting. Yeah, imagine as a last thought, imagine a scenario where your CEO comes to you and says, hey, we need to become more customer centric. We're going to roll out these three technology platforms. And, you know, and you're like, okay, well, let, maybe let's just go do a bit of user research and find out, you know, what the customer needs. And you go back and you go, actually, we don't need to pay for any of these. Here's a quick and easy solve that's going to cost you one one hundredth of the price. 
just imagine how good <laughs> you're going to look um, by having saved all that time and money. And that can be done just by sort of doing user research, getting down and, and really digging into what people actually need. So there's all kinds of tools, techniques we can talk about. We're going to send an email out tomorrow. Um, thank you so much, everyone, for listening. Um, uh, we are always here if you want to have a chat uh, about a program. You know, we run one-day courses right through to larger programs. Um, we do project delivery as well. Um, Mark is always available at either, either of us on LinkedIn. Um, we've also just added in a um, sort of a digital trend or a customer-centric transformation framework that we often use as a baseline. If anyone wants to download that from the chat just before we go. Um, otherwise, thank you very much. Um, super fun for me. Hopefully it was for you, Mark. Thank you for joining. Uh, yeah, any thank last you. words? Um, no, just good luck, everyone. It's, uh, you know, we're heading into a new fin year and it feels like there is a lot of demand in the market for this kind of thinking. So, uh, yeah, have a, have a good ride on it. Yeah. Thanks so much, guys. And yeah, look out for the email with some additional assets coming tomorrow. Bye. Cheers.